much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm glad we're talking about improving child nutrition today, but like many of my colleagues, I'm very disappointed in the substitute amendment to the Improving Child Nutrition and Education Act of 2016. This legislation rolls back science-based nutrition standards that are working to improve the health and development of students in every community. This legislation makes it more difficult for children to access healthy meals, and it places new burdens on our schools. Despite a number of hearings on child nutrition programs, this committee missed the opportunity to work together to produce a bipartisan reauthorization. That would have required some compromise. It would have required members on both sides of the aisle to give up some of their priorities. But instead, this legislation we're considering reflects the views of only some members of this committee. In fact, the various versions of the legislation that have been made public in the past weeks have become increasingly partisan, uh, unfortunately. And it does not have a path uh, toward becoming law. The legislation not only does not strengthen the summer EBT program, which has demonstrated tremendous success in addressing food insecurity among children, it curtails the program and denies states the flexibility they need to administer it effectively. The legislation chips away at nutrition standards that have been adopted in nearly every school and diminishes the role of science in setting standards. One third of the children in our country are overweight or obese. One quarter of young adults are too heavy to serve in our armed services. I don't understand why we would choose to roll back reasonable standards that are already in place and offer up foods that are less healthy to our kids. This legislation raises the community eligibility qualification threshold. Now, I've heard some of my colleagues defend this policy as a way to make sure that undeserving children don't get subsidized meals. But the evidence is clear that community eligibility reimbursements are based on analyses that approximate the number of qualifying children. The policy in this legislation doesn't improve program integrity. It merely strips schools of streamlined, less burdensome processes and erects new barriers to nutritious meals for low-income children. The legislation creates a new block grant program, something the School Nutrition Association has called reckless. This proposal abandons our promise to make sure that low-income students are given an opportunity to succeed by having access to the healthy meals that support physical and mental development and academic achievement. Despite glimmers of bipartisanship, I appreciate working with Ms. Stefanik, this legislation would make it more difficult for children to access healthy meals. It runs counter to the goals of federal child nutrition programs. I urge my colleagues to reject the substitute amendment. And Mr. Chairman, I, I speak with students a lot. I recently um, had a roundtable discussion at a, a school in Hillsboro, Oregon, and some of the students were there who benefited from these programs. And they talked about how this really makes a difference. They can concentrate uh, because they have these school meals. Let's work together and come up with a bipartisan version that expands access to healthy meals for children. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Mr.